Maligayang Sinyo Lahat. Happy Sabbath! I know this is not International Day, but I'm trying to get my Tagalog together because I'm going home in February for three weeks. So for those that think that I can speak the language, uh, please do not look for me and start talking to me because I don't know. I know. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, I don't know what's happening, but the, the, the change of weather is making me tear up. So I'm not crying, really. So just bear with me. If anything starts to keep on flowing, just ignore me because the message this morning is going to change your life because I know it did for me. Amen. I want to say thank you to Michaela. Boy, her parents did a great job of raising her because hearing her sing this morning just fills my heart. What a blessing. It got me all teared up, you know, got me all choked up. I want to say also thank you to all my friends. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you, Elvira, for coming. See, I got all emotional already. But anyways, thank you for my family for coming here. And also the visitors that have decided to to be here with us today to worship with us. To those who may, who may not know me, my name is Eileen Almazara, and I am one of the deaconesses here at Virginia Beach Church. But before I begin, I want to say thank you to our pastor, Pastor Jorge. He's not here today. He, he, he left, and um, he's away right now, and I know that he told me that he was going to watch me uh, preach today, but thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to come today to speak to your people. But when he had asked me, actually, uh, it was about four or five months ago. So what happened was, uh, when he asked me, I told him that I had to pray about it. Because in order to speak here at the pulpit, it takes responsibility, it takes commitment. And I needed the Holy Spirit to move my soul to say yes. So I did three weeks ago. And um, as I was writing the sermon, I already had an idea because God had revealed it to me. And I told God, because I had a pretty busy schedule, I said, Lord, can you just write this sermon within the week, you know, first week? Because I have a lot going on. But he had plans for me. I just actually just finished writing the sermon two days ago. That's three weeks time. And I realized that he wanted to spend time with me. He wanted me to say this this morning with conviction. And I really appreciate Pastor and all the elders and who has to be here every Saturday. It's a really tough job, I must say. And hopefully this message will be a blessing, but also a wake-up call for all of us here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God of the universe, thank you for the privilege of sharing your message this morning to your people. I ask the Holy Spirit to guide my words and actions according to your will. Hide me behind the cross so that your people may see your glory shining through me. I ask all these things in your son Jesus. Amen. You must get your way. The city is being punished. Turned into a pillar of salt, 
for disobeying God. In this short movie clip, God rained down brimstone and fire from heaven upon Sodom. But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. So the title of my sermon today is Don't Look Back. The story of Lot is not only disturbing, but one of the most dramatic moments in human history. This powerful story found in the book of Genesis offers many profound life, set, uh, life lessons, consequences of sin, power of intercession, and call to obedience. Now, let me start saying this. Most people have this misconception that God only destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for their homosexual immorality. But in Ezekiel 1649 says, they were guilty of other sins too, like pride, selfishness, overabundance of food, wealth, and did not help the poor and needy. Jude 1 7 says, Sodom and Gomorrah and surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal life. Now, just a little backdrop. I'm not going to assume that all of you know the story. In Genesis chapter 14, 8, Sodom and Gomorrah were not only the cities that God destroyed. There were three other cities, Adma, Zeboim, and Zor. Later in the story, I will, I will explain that the reason why God destroyed Zor last. Think about this a moment. Fast forward in today's time, 2024, we see the sins of Sodom, not only five cities, but all over the world. In fact, the sin of Sodom is worse today than ever before. If you don't believe me, just turn on your television. For instance, we have a reality show's Sister Wives. This consists of one husband and four wives. The next one is Bachelor and Bachelorette. This consists of one bachelor, Bachelorette, and they date not just one, but many and they offer one single rose at the end for marriage proposal. The next one, love is blind. Yeah, this is a good one. Is a concept of finding love without physical appearance first. No, that doesn't work for me. But anyways, they are in the pod. These contestants are in the pod and they, the concept of it is to, for you to know that person without seeing their physical appearance. <laughs> the last one, and I don't, I don't want you to think that I've seen all these shows, but I had to do it for the sermon. I had to watch a little bit to understand. The next one, ladies, if you're single, don't do this, love after lockup. The title itself should explain to you what that means. They're dating people that are in prison and hopefully they'll have a happy life after they get out. Have mercy. Finding love in all the wrong places. If anything, the depravity of the world today makes Sodom and Gomorrah look inviting and should be listed as one of the best cities to raise your family. Sure, we might not turn into a pillar of salt today, but this is a warning to Proverbs 11.21. Hear me now. Be sure of this, the wicked will not go unpunished, but those who are righteous will go free. I don't know about this, if, if any of you, if this message is speaking to someone's heart right now. But God is making his appeal to you this morning. It is not a coincidence that you are here today. Some of us, and you know who you are, living a life of sin without repentance. If you happen to fall asleep during my sermon, it's okay. Just remember this. Don't let your past be a stumbling block that you cannot move forward. Stop looking back and let go of the past. No matter how far you've strayed or how heavy your burden of guilt may be, there is always a way back. 
1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, the Bible says, and just, and he will forgive all of our sins from all unrighteousness. Not just some, all of your sins. Now, to better understand the story, I want to set up the stage. I want to tell you a story. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 18. Here we see that God visits Abraham. And you know who Abraham is? The father of faith, right? The father of many sons. God tells Abraham, after he ate a wonderful meal, that he was going to destroy Sodom because their wickedness has come up before him. In fact, the Bible tells us in verse 20, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were so great and their sins so grievous. God told Abraham because his nephew Lot lived in Sodom. Verse 22 says the men turned away and went towards Sodom. So there were two angels with him that day. They're going back to Sodom now. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. This is his friend. 23. Then Abraham approached him and said, here we find, get this, Abraham negotiating with God. Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? 24. Lord, what about 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really destroy it and not spare the, the place for the sake of 50? 26. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city, I will spare the whole place for your sake. 27. Then Abraham spoke up again, Lord, what about 45? Do I hear 45? <laughs> what about 30? Can you spare the, can you place, can, can, can you just not destroy it if there's 30 people? And then he goes down to 10. God answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Isn't it something that we always try to negotiate with God and have nothing in return? Because that's what negotiations mean. I give you something and you give something back. Abraham didn't have anything to give. Not even 10 righteous people were found because when we pick up in Genesis chapter 19, the two angels appear as men into the town of Sodom. Here we find Lot now at the gates of Sodom. Lot was working overtime that night because it's nighttime. He is not at home having dinner with his family. He's right there at the gates. And he, he invites these two strangers to his house. Okay? And the original plan was to spend the night in the town square, out in the open. Genesis 19.3. You know, when I read this verse, I don't know. My first thought was, why did God send angels to warn Lot? You ever think about that? I mean, God is all powerful, right? He could have just sent the warning in his dream, right? You see, God already knew Lot's wife was a bad girl. She's a bad influence. Let's be real. How many married women here, okay, have a big influence over their husband? when making decisions. Raise Vance. I know I do. Like when there's a big purchase and he doesn't want it, I just have to like, come on, babe, can I get one of those? And, oh, okay, what about a, a one hour long massage? Like, yeah, okay, sure. Same thing with Lot's wife. We inherited the power of persuasion from our mother, Eve. It happened a long time ago. We have the gift, ladies. <laughs> Anyways, that's another sermon. Let's go back to the story at hand. Verse, verse 4 through 9. And I will just summarize. Before they went to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded Lot's house. Lot, where are the men who came with you tonight? Bring them out to us 
so we can know them carnally. And I'm just doing this PG-13 for your kids, but you know what I mean. Lot goes outside, and it was okay for him to go outside because these are his friends, right? He wanted to go out there to defuse the situation. These are his colleagues, business people that he's worked with. Shh! What are you all doing here? What's going on? These men are my guests, brothers. Don't do this wicked thing. These guests are my roof and my protection. Verse 8. For all the fathers out there, when I read this, this is not a good father. Because the Bible says Lot offers his two virgin daughters instead. If you don't believe me, the Bible says he tells the men to do whatever you wish with them. And I want to point out that during Abraham's time, hospitality was considered a sacred duty. Still, it does not justify his, de his decision. And it just shows that Lot's moral confusion at that time, where even a righteous man could be driven to make a desperate and misguided choice. How do I know that he's righteous? I'm about to tell you right now. 2 Peter 2, 7 through 10 describes him best. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as the righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. You see, Lot already surveyed Sodom years back. He went there and he checked the place out, right? Scoped the place out, if you will. He went online and read all the reviews on Google. All the boxes were checked. Beautiful, greenery, all the parties that are happening. I need to live here. The Bible says he saw all the evil things happening in his city day after day. Not just once in a while. This is daily. I don't know, call Lot righteous all you want to. But the matter of the fact is, Lot was guilty by association. He knew it was wrong, but remained in silence. How many of us today have missed opportunities and remained silent? That we ever miss opportunities to tell our coworkers, our friends that are unsaved, we're not able to share the gospel. Clearly, Lot was not having Bible studies or prayer Wednesday meetings at his house. If he did, God probably could have spared the city. Amen? Amen. Besides, this type of behavior wasn't anything new to Lot. So out of desperation to protect his guests, Lot offered his daughters. The men of Sodom refused and attempted to force their way and break into Lot's home. They were pressing a lot hard, trying to get in. Verse 9, get out of our way. I don't know who you think you are, judging us, calling us, calling our behavior wicked. You're the foreigner in this city. You are nobody. And if you don't move out of the way, we will treat you worse than them. So I'm assuming that the angels hear this, right? All this commotion all this drama going on outside. So the angels pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Verse 11, then the angels struck the men who were at the door, young and old, with blindness. Let me tell you, sexual sin will make you do some crazy things. Just, just watch criminals.com on, on, on TV, on YouTube. And remember the, the lady from, I think she was in the military, she drove I don't know how many hours and all these states just to be with her uh, because of her jealousy wanted to kill this individual. 
These men were blind and still trying to get some, trying to get through the door. The Bible says they were so tired trying to find the door. Come on now, if suddenly I lose my sight, what, what did you think that I need to know what's going on with my, eye, with my eyesight? These men didn't care. He kept on, they kept on pressing hard to get through, to get these men, these strangers. I would have to go to the nearest sodomite urgent care or something, you know? But no, they just kept on going. Verse 12. The two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, son-in-laws, sons or daughters, in the city who belongs to you? You need to get them out because we are going to destroy this place. Verse 14, listen to this. Lot goes to his son-in-laws now, tells them that God will destroy the city, but they thought he was merely joking. How many times has God sent us warnings and we fail to take him seriously? I sinned before, nothing happened. I'm good. I have a good job. There's no need for God. Right? Until, until, until it's too late. Verse 15. Now this scene is where Lot must convince his wife to leave the city. She knows about it. But you know how this goes, ladies. Right? This is all to the husbands here in the audience right now. And you can relate to how Lot was feeling of having the talk. That conversation was not going to be easy to tell his wife to leave everything behind because God is about to destroy the city. And I'll give you a modern day conversation between Lot and his wife. Here we go, Lot's wife. Come on, my love. The bank doesn't even open till nine o'clock in the morning. What about all our money? What about our house, our pool, all our cars? You worked so hard all your life. We're gonna leave everything behind? We can't leave now. Surely you can tell God to stop all this madness. Apparently something made him think about all his possessions because the Bible says Lot hesitated. Lot was just strolling along, taking a sweet little time. At this point, the angels had to take the matter into their own hands by grabbing Lot's hand, his wife, and his daughters to take them out. You see, God didn't save Lot because of who he was, but because of his mercy and covenant with Abraham. He saved Lot and his family because Abraham prayed for them. Thank God for the power of intercession. Amen? Amen. You know, as a parent, one of the most painful feelings is watching your child backslide in their faith. But this morning I have some good news. Be like Abraham. Rather than losing hope, continue to pray for them. Trust that the seeds planted in their hearts can still bear good fruits. And that God's grace is always available, no matter how far they've lost their way. You see, Lot didn't need and deserve to be rescued because Lot put wealth above God. But somewhere there was a man named Abraham who loved him, who prayed for him, and for Abraham's sake, God showed him mercy. Genesis 19, 17. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, this is the angel, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. The instructions were clear, right? Crystal clear. What is it? Run for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop. They all speak about being in motion and looking forward and not backward. 
Genesis 19, verse 8, 18. Here we find Lot negotiating. It, it must run in the family, negotiating. He negotiates with the angels. And Lot pleads, I can't go to the mountains. I will die there. This is what he tells them. You see, Lot was used to the finer things in life, right? He, had, he probably had maids. Remember, Lot is a very wealthy man. Wealthy. Going to Ruth Chris, Flemings, Texas de Brazil. You know, he was, that was the finer things in life. And he was about to go to the mountains? Oh, no, no, no. Even when his home was on the brink of destruction, this guy was worried about some special accommodation. Can you hear present day Lot telling the angel, there's no internet, there's no restaurants or grocery stores in the mountains, there's probably no water. I can't live there, I'll die there. Instead of the attitude of gratitude, he was making prayer requests. Verse 21. He said to him, very well, grant this request too. You know, when I read this, I was like, the angels are probably like, God, leave this guy. I mean, really? We're about to destroy this place and you are asking me for favors. Verse 22. Get this, but flee there quickly now because I cannot do anything until you reach the city Zor safely. Did you read that? Do I need to repeat it? He said, I cannot do anything until you get there safely. God weighed, held back destruction until his whole family were safe. You know, God is a loving God merciful that of all the people of Sodom God chose to spare his life how many of us are grateful this morning come on now out of all the people in Virginia Beach God chose to spare your life and held back car accidents on your way to church God chose to heal your illness God chose to give you another life because that's why you're here verse 24 and then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from heaven. He overthrew those cities and the entire plain and the vegetation in the land. He wiped everything out. Verse 26, but Lot's wife looked longingly and was turned into a pillar of salt. You see, the problem with Lot's wife, her heart was still in Sodom. Her physical body was running toward the mountains, yes, but her heart was still stuck in Sodom. Longingly indicates that the real problem was the condition of her soul. She longed for the city she had left behind. And while anyone who has ever left home can relate to this sentiment, Sodom and Gomorrah was no ordinary place. This is a party town. This is Vegas 3.0, right? The people indulged in excess and blatant immorality. The people who lived there was intensely wicked, the Bible says, which means that Lot's wife was not just homesick for her friends back home. It was her wealth and her depraved lifestyle. And God wanted, wanted her to have a new life, a new soul. But she liked her old life better. Some of us here right now have heard God's voice numerous times, but we ignore his calls, his plea. I should know I want, I, I'm one of them. Until one day God saved my life, which I will save the part of my story at the end. So don't leave yet. Verse 30. Lot and his daughters now eventually leave sore. And be, because despite of being spared from destruction, the people who lived there reminded him of Sodom's wickedness. You see, God will let you 
choose because that's our, our right. That's a gift from God is to allow you to choose whether it's good or bad. Because God already knew, okay, you can go there. You can go to the little city. Mm -hmm. But you'll find out. And he did. It is not enough to walk away from sin externally. We must allow God to transform our hearts. Here, verse 31. And this is very disturbing, besides the other things that I've said. Lot's daughters feared they would never have husbands or children, so out of desperation and sinful decision, they chose to get his, her, their father, Lot, drunk and conceived children through him. You know, they might have escaped the physical destruction of Sodom, but the sins of Sodom were still in their hearts. How many of us today may have left our own Sodoms, but still carry its value in our hearts? Maybe it's the pursuit of worldly pleasures, desires for power, or compromise our morals for temporary gain. We may have removed ourselves from bad situations, but if we don't allow God to renew our hearts, those sinful desires will return in our lives. See, Lost Daughters really teaches us that escaping the destruction of sin is the first step. So you have to realize you're sinning, right? The real transformation happens when you allow God to remove Sodom from your hearts. Almost done. And this is my personal testimony. And this story, unfortunately, my family does not know anything about this story because I'm one of those daughters that keep all of her personal life for herself. And I try to avoid at all costs to be a burden to my, to my parents. Years, and this is my testimony of his love and grace for me. Years ago, I don't know, maybe 14, 15 years ago. After a night of drinking with friends, I decided to drive home. So the next morning, I see all these phone calls from my girlfriend. So I call her back, and I thought something had happened. And she said, girl, did you not see that car in front of you? I said, well, what car? I was like, you, swer you were swerving all over the road. I said, no, I'm sorry, I, I didn't really see anything. I don't really hardly remember how I got home. That's when I knew that God spared my life. At that time, my heart was still not fully transformed because I kept looking back at my past. And I would fall off the wagon here and there. And I'm talking not just by drinking, I'm talking about simple lifestyle. And I don't know this morning your wake-up call, but mine was when my father died four years ago from lung cancer. If, I watched him die, actually, in my mom's home. And if a parent that you love so much dies in front of you, if that itself, in itself is not an encouragement to change, I don't know what will. And that was just four years ago. That was my wake-up call, to get my life together. Because you know why? I want to see my dad again. I want to see my Lola and my Lolo, which is my grandparents. I want to see them again. Because had I died that night, I knew my death would have been final. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. This means there is no more opportunity to change before God. The Bible is clear, and I'm just the messenger. I didn't write all this, God did. Revelation 20, 15 says, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. See, Lot's wife, her death was final. 
No more second chances, thirds and fourths. It's over. It's a wrap. Done. And this is a tragic truth for all those who reject God on a daily. Especially parents, even for your own soul. This should be a wake-up call. Look at your children. You have to think for yourself, are they going to make it? Am I going to make it? It is not God's desire for anyone to perish, but he honors our free will, and the consequences of rejecting salvation are eternal. Here's some end credits to my story. Here are some seven pre-decisions that you can make today for the life you want tomorrow. Number one, be prepared. Be in God's word. You want to know who God is? You need to read the Bible. And what does the song say? Read the Bible every day. Number two, be faithful. Honor God in everything you do. Workplace, in the home. Number three, be consistent. Follow God's example. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Number four, be generous. God loves a cheerful giver. Number five, be devoted. Devote your life to God. And number six, influence others. Don't be silent like Lot. Take a stand for your beliefs. Lastly, be a finisher like Jesus. Because he says what? It is finished. Thank God he didn't give me the, what I deserved that night. Thank God for his amazing grace. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath. Thank you for all those that have been here to hear your message. I pray, Lord, that we should not be looking back. Help us with your Holy Spirit to move forward for your second coming. I ask all these things in the forgiveness of all of our sins. Amen. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow